Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. Today's episode, we're going to explore how trauma shows up in our relationships. We spent the past two episodes talking about the impact that our early relationships have on our current ones through the stories that we create or the assumptions that we make, and also through our definitions of closeness or connection. Now we're going to dive into the experience of living that early wounding or pain in our current relationships. We're always listening to your feedback, your comments, your questions about our topics and episodes. And something that recurs each time is this humanness that we share, those emotions, these feelings, sometimes that make it feel impossible to get to this place of authentic connection or consciousness. So some of the comments back to our last two episodes and conversations are people in the community, you know, wanting or wishing or hoping to someday get to this level of consciousness that Nicole and I are displaying in our relationship. And when I hear that, it really sticks with me because it's really important that we are also, Nicole and myself, continuing to shine a light on the fact that we're just as human as all of you are. We have the same emotions. We have the same feelings. Although we're able to get to a place of connection and communication from spending the time to know ourselves first, there are also absolutely moments where we butt heads, we can't communicate, we become mean, we become reactive, our humanness shows or we become this all-consuming pain body where I can't actually regulate and step out of that thought to just powerfully choose another one in the presence. My physical body actually almost feels taken over. So we want to discuss that a little bit more today and also how that shows up differently. My trauma shows up physically and mentally for me in some ways similar to Nicole's and in other ways very different because we come from our own unique paths. What you're talking about, Jenna, and even referring to it as a different state of consciousness. We want to remain conscious. We want to be connected to our authentic or our heart space so that we can be in a, in a truly loving relationship with the reality being most of us aren't able to remain in that state of consciousness all of the time. And what happens is we actually go to a lower, a different part of our brain. Um, I said lower because it's actually located more near your brainstem. It's where all of our memories are housed, where all of our emotions are housed. And in those moments when we are reacting from what you're calling a pain body, we're in a living reaction we actually lose access to our consciousness state. We're unable to think logically. We're unable to remember how screaming and yelling didn't get us the response or the goal or the outcome that we had intended it the last time. We actually do shift or downshift into a different state of consciousness entirely. While that may sound like a breath of fresh air, hopefully to many of you, I suggest to also be careful not to let that be an excuse where we suddenly go, oh, I'm in this pain body. Oh, I can't access that. I am dysregulated. So now it's just a freebie. I can run around as a terror. That's also our choice to do the work and the preemptive work to continue regulating and be living really in existence in a grounded space or more grounded than we were yesterday so that we have more access to remaining conscious to that point of consciousness, to actually having the choice in the moment with the support of our environment around us to attempt to snap out of it. I know even you and I, Nicole, will get into arguments even the other day or discussions. And there's moments where we've both looked at each other. I remember specifically looking in the eyes the other day and being like, Nicole, hey, come back, Nicole, like be here right now. I'm throwing you a rope, grab onto it. Let's stay present. And the same goes for me when you know, I'm being mean or I'm being snappy and I'm being reactive. The easiest way to help support me in that moment is for my partners or the people around me to speak to me kindly, to instead of getting reactive themselves, to gently nudge, you know, hey, this isn't actually you right now. And I can absolutely 100% understand how that sounds like a glorified fairy tale. That's the reality I've created for myself now after literally decades and years, a whole lifetime of work. So that doesn't just poof into existence. However, it can and it does when you decide to be responsible for yourself and start to create and set boundaries for yourself and for the people and environments around you. So as all things that we talk about um, in the circle and on this podcast, it is a process. And let's kind of go back a little bit 
and speak first about what is happening when we're in that, what we're calling a pain body or when we're in that reaction. Because in those moments, um, a lot of us don't want that life raft. We're not even interested. We don't need, we're not even sure that our loved one in that moment is actually still our loved one. Because again, we're responding or we're reacting more, more accurately from a very deep emotional and survival driven place. It's actually a function of our, our fight or flight response. And when we're in that state of reactivity, we really do feel scared. We really do feel threatened. Um, the feelings that we're having in those moments, being hurt, being angry, being sad, whatever it is that we're feeling overwhelmed by, when I say we become it, it really does become an all-consuming reality for us. Though a reality, to speak to your suggestion of coming back and being present, the reality that we're living in in that moment is a reality from our past. It doesn't make it, though, any less of a reality. It doesn't make our feelings any less real. And unfortunately, what we're left to do in that moment is to cope with the feeling exactly the way we learned very early on in time, which is why for most of us, and definitely myself included, the reactions we're having, what we're doing, how we're trying to regulate, whether it's screaming or yelling or running away and icing the person and not speaking to them, giving them a silent treatment, it's a reason why those reactions appear a bit immature, because they are, because they were formed and practiced from a very early point in time where those were the only options that we had to keep ourselves safe, to literally fight the enemy at hand, even if it's the enemy that where's the face of your loved one, or to run away from the threat. And that's often then what we do. And of course, what we end up doing, most of us, is we end up feeling very shameful once the event and our emotions have de-escalated and we come back into our consciousness and ground ourselves back in reality, speak for myself, it feels really shameful when I can revisit, oh my gosh, I screamed and yelled and said this terrible thing to someone I loved, or I stopped talking to them completely and shut my phone off. How hurtful. And now we have a compounded experience of our own wounding that was very real, and then our best attempt to cope, which many times leads us, leads us all down very shameful paths. We are the ones that box ourselves in. It's not this super strong, empowered past that just has a hold over us. We are the ones that allow that past to have a hold over us. And I think sometimes that's the missing link that we skip over so easily is that responsibility. It is me who allows my past to then box me in in those moments, which is why I say the preemptive work, the preventative work, the work beforehand to ground ourselves so that when I'm not in a pain body, when I'm not in a reaction and I am here, I do have resources, I am grounded. That's the daily consistent work so that when there are flare ups, when there are arguments, when there are moments of dysregulation or chaos amongst any aspect of my life, I, at my core, have a way to go back to my own regulation and also am beginning at a more grounded space so in those moments when our past does show up, when we do box ourselves in, we do go into that same reaction. Rather than beating ourselves up for it, there is a moment of really refreshing empowerment, at least for me, when I'm able to depersonalize it and see the response that's happening or the reactivity that's happening, understand why that may be happening, where that comes from, and then to also recognize oh, I'm not that mean person. I'm not mean. I'm not evil. I'm not cruel. However, my actions and my reaction in that moment may absolutely be like that. And that's something for me to look at. Taking the two of those things away, understanding that I am a self, I am a pure, whole, complete Jenna over here that has these reactions or moments and experiences actually gives me something to work with. A couple of weeks ago, actually, I was on a Zoom with our team with Fiza and Brittany. If you guys are listening, hello. Uh, I was on with them and I was sharing with them about an interaction that I'd had here at home with Nicole and Lolly. And during these last couple of months, especially in these really new depths of grief, it's only been two and a half, three months since Jake passed. A lot in our lives has changed. Uh, a lot is happening in our lives. There are a lot of extremes going on. And there are a lot of new depths of me and my own despair that I'm new to, that I'm newly seeing. This wounded Jenna that I'd pushed so far away that 
really has no choice but to bubble up in the cracks of this pain and this grief now. And sometimes that does show up as this super snappy Jenna, a very reactive or mean saying cruel things or in a tone that I don't mean from my heart. And when I have partners that can call me on that, albeit in the moment, I may not want to be receptive of it. I may not be receptive and certainly am triggered at times being told you're mean or you're cruel. And when I really pause to look afterwards, I know that I have enough trust in my own self and intuition to also understand and discern that I've created an environment around me that is loving, that is pure, that I can trust and behold. I've created that for myself prior to. So I know when I am hearing these things from people that I love, there's something to listen to there. There's something to discover for me. And it was great for me to share this with my team. And why I was sharing this with my team is because it's so human. And it was such a great teaching for me in itself to be able to pull the two things away and to use an example of me being mean or me being reactive and snippy. So it's not just always an example of another person, but no, this is me, Jenna, acting like this mean, snippy 13-year-old to my partners when I'm a grown woman. Being able to express that, to take away the personalization of it and say, yeah, I did do that. There is this wounding that still comes up and out of this fear immediately goes to tear these people down, to destroy this love that isn't conditional, that is true, that is always there for me. That's very threatening. Why is this person loving me when I'm being so mean? The first thing I want to do is go to get rid of them. When I can start to understand that pattern and behavior and even express it to another I let all of my humanness shine through. I get to express this human shell that is me walking around with all of these human feelings and emotions, kind of going through this video game and learning what works and what doesn't work. So when you talk about meanness and when I acknowledge the moments where, you know, I experience you as mean and just as equally, I know there's been many moments where I've said mean things, I've done mean things either through direct action or through withdrawal. I know that can just be experienced just equally as mean when I ice you, when I push you away, when I abandon you. And for you, I understand that is a core wound. That can be mean behavior as well. And when you say the word threat, these people are threats, you're really speaking the truth of the matter. We do then see whoever it is in front of us, even if it is the face of a loved one, as an enemy of sorts. We actually can't care about who they are as a separate individual, we lose the ability because we are solely focused on ourselves, on what we need to do to become safe. So in the moments where I'm mean right back, um, where I'm withholding, you know, because I've been hurt by some event over here, in that moment, I've more or less deleted you as Jenna. You're no longer Jenna. You are between me. You are the the hindrance or, or the obstacle, if you will, between me and safety. And we really do go into a survival or a protection mode. And the reason why, you know, this is coming up and I'm sharing this, you know, especially on the heels of acknowledging the shame. And of course, this isn't the free pass to say, oh, well, it's okay. I deleted you because I was finding safety for myself. It's to understand because a lot of us can be really hard on ourselves. can hear the things coming out of our mouth, either in real time or after the fact, and see the pain and devastation we might have caused a loved one and feel really shameful and wonder what the heck is wrong with us that we're hurting those we love. And the reason is, again, because the person we love is no longer the person we love in that moment of reactivity. They are the obstacle between me and safety. And the only thing I can care about is finding safety for myself. And sometimes that means at the detriment of someone else. It's really a rude awakening for ourselves when you do have that moment or flash of consciousness or presence in the midst of what we're calling a pain body or in the midst of that reactivity or outburst where all we're doing, the only reason that we're in that reactivity itself is to keep ourselves safe. We're actually putting others in a space where there's now unsafety amongst them because at our core and at our depth, we felt so desperately unsafe. And that might seem odd to someone who's thinking, you know, well, how could you feel unsafe if the environment around you is just giving you unconditional love or presence or support, whatever you need? Well, if that's not what you knew when you were 
a child, if that's not what you were given from your parents or your caregivers, if that wasn't the environment that you grew into, understanding, okay, this is love and support, then it literally becomes a foreign entity. Just like when a foreign entity comes into your body, your system goes to attack it. It's foreign. It doesn't feel safe and familiar. So it's a space too in those moments when you do have that flash of presence, or maybe it's in reflection afterwards, when you've actually calmed down, very rarely do most of us have these big outbursts or screaming matches, and then suddenly mid-scream just stop and think, I don't actually want to be doing this right now. I'm not really upset. This is my past. That's really just not realistic. It may happen for some in a blue moon, though that's not reality to us on our day to day. So a lot of the time this happens in reflection afterwards. And it happened for me in that reflection that I was then sharing with our team, because the example that I was sharing was a reflection of many. You could put in any variable there that is just the moment of after the fact, being able to reflect back on witnessing ourselves in a moment where we aren't in full control. We aren't in the driver's seat. We are in an autopilot that is, yes, trying to keep us safe, but that is in full reactivity. Instead of sitting there and blaming myself or criticizing myself for that, the first thing that I have to be responsible for is to forgive myself for that. I first need to forgive myself for it. And then if necessary, potentially forgiving the other person. I mean, if I push Nicole enough, she's absolutely going to snap. You know, someone can only just stay so Zen and grounded for so long, and we'll we'll dig our knives in. We will continue to push and twist just until we can get the other person to arc or to burst because we want their reaction. We're also so desperate for connection. So in those moments, this primal reptilian self that is me doesn't actually care if Nicole's giving me love or not back. I just want to push her enough so that I can connect with her. Because if I get a response from her in one direction or the other, it is connection, it is communication. And even though it's not really fulfilling me, or even though it's not really safe, that connection in itself is giving me an environment of the familiar. It's bringing me back to what I know. For so many of us, the reality is, is safety isn't familiar. We are stuck in a nervous system that's locked in fight or flight. Any moment where we do begin to move towards safety, it feels foreign, especially if it's with another human being, If especially if it's trying to look to the other for a life ba- vest or for that hand to be held out to help us restabilize back into safety. Though that's the work that we're looking to do. And of course, Oftentimes it doesn't happen in those moments. Yes, there are some moments where if we're not super reactive or super down that rabbit hole and spiral and you have a partner that looks at you and attempts to ground you into the safety of what's happening now, that can be successful. Though oftentimes it's like you said, after the fact, when I review what happened or preventatively before the fact, learning your own cues, learning your partner's cues as they begin to fall into that state of dysregulation can help you to hit pause, to take a space, to not maybe have that difficult conversation at this time, or to give you the opportunity to reground yourself in safety. So almost stopping before we get to that point of of conflict or climax or, you know, where we're both so far down that spiral. And all of this takes the practice of learning yourself, of learning what are your escalation points? Can you begin to feel your body moving toward that point of no return, as I call it, where I won't be able to control my reaction? And can you with a partner, if you you do have a partner in in your life, in your space that's supportive, can the two of you together come up with a new process for what happens when one or both of you begins to feel out of control or destabilize with, with the goal being always being responsible, being aware of how far you are from that safe ground at place and learning the steps that you need to take and your system, your partnership needs to take to find that safety together. I want to preface again, as I do each episode, that while we're talking about a relationship in partnership or a relationship with another or whatever is in your environment or home, that first relationship is also with yourself first and foremost. So the suggestions that we might have about taking steps with a partner or finding that common ground to help each other in those moments, those are steps first to also take with yourself All throughout the day, all day long, 
I forgive myself. There are so many opportunities from sunup to sundown for me to offer forgiveness, to offer forgiveness to me, to Nicole, to Lolly, to anyone who's in my experience. And first and foremost, to myself, everything that I offer to another, I first have to offer to myself. So if you're sitting here and we're talking about relationship and that's just already flown over your head or you've disengaged, the relationship that we're talking about here first is with yourself. So even though we use the word partnership, or if we're talking about another person, we're actually then talking about three relationships. We're talking about the relationship person A has with themselves, the relationship person B has with themselves, and then the relationship that person A and B have together. But it first is a reflection and a mirror of you and yourself first. So please hear everything that is being said or discussed about partnership and relationship as a relationship with you yourself first. So whether we're talking about forgiving ourselves or finding safety within ourselves, what we're talking about, as we often do, is not just the theory of it, the concept, the idea, it's the embodiment, actually doing it in those moments, whether it's offering the forgiveness or, you know, giving yourself a couple deep belly breaths to create safety before you go in and have a stressful conversation. We're talking about embodying the work and I actually was doing some reading And I came upon this quote and I wanted to read it because I think it applies to our conversation today. And it's a quote by Joseph Campbell. And it says, when we quit thinking primarily about ourselves and our own self-preservation, we undergo a truly heroic transformation of consciousness. And this really embodies what we're talking about today, right? We can't think about another. We are only thinking about ourself and our our self-preservation when we're locked in trauma, when we're having an overwhelming emotional experience. And as we begin to practice out of that, to grant ourselves the safety, to forgive ourselves for what we've done in those moments, then we're actually transforming our form. Um, I really love the definition of transformation that I think Dr. Joe Dispenza offered, which is transformation is changing form. We're actually living a new experience of ourself Um, through relationship with ourself that then, as I often say, has that domino effect, the ripples that then continue to affect not only ourselves, but the relationships we're in, the world and the impact that we have. So again, what we're talking about here is doing that work of transformation, is learning yourself and or beginning to cultivate a relationship with yourself so that you can have an awareness of What are my points of escalation? What does my pain body do in those moments when it is fully active? And how can I create the safety that I need and the compassion and the forgiveness while I walk that journey into a new embodiment? All of our traumas and all of our experiences are never going to be far behind wherever we go on our journey. They're always with us, even here in the now. It's just when we give thought to them, when we bring them into the present, when we allow our bodies to remain stuck in the past, that's when we start to relive them. That's when we start to get into that territory of, well, we're changing something, not transforming. We're just changing it from one sort of matter morphing it into another. Transforming, as you're talking about, is actually creating something new entirely. It's creating a new future, creating a new present. Instead of just having this same recycled past show up in new ways, in new relationships, and in new obstacles or situations. So it is of great benefit to all of us to stop expecting the trauma to not be there, to stop expecting that there's some miraculous day where just poof, we lose all of this humanness and all of our emotion and we don't respond. If that were to happen, we would also lose joy. We would lose love. We would lose presence. We would lose all of the same emotions that we choose to cultivate, the ones that we want. We also only know those. We only know joy because we know joy's opposite. So all of that trauma, all of the past, everything that we are working to heal and transform, we also have a really big opportunity to be grateful for. It's that very past that, no, is never going to poof, be gone. It is always with us. 
That and its contrast is what allows us to see the light and the creation that we're going towards. It also shows us in the moment, it's the power of our choice. I'm one thought away from how I want to feel. Now, I might need to think that new thought over and over and over again, maybe every minute for a few minutes or multiple times a minute. It's not one and done. However, I am the one responsible for choosing to ruminate in the past or not, choosing to have a new thought, to feel a new feeling. That's my choice. That's the stark reality that I can offer myself that actually is incredibly empowering. I may need to choose that thought over and over, but what we often don't realize is that ruminating in the past, sitting in the past, sitting in these feelings that maybe we don't want or we say we don't want, we actually are wanting them. We are choosing them. How do we know it's us that's choosing them? because we're having them, because we're doing them, whether we'd like to admit it or not. However we're existing, however we're responding is our choice. So it's my choice also to understand that and realize I want to feel different. I want to choose another thought. However many seconds there are in a day, those are how many opportunities I have to choose that new thought. And again, we're not going to set ourselves up for any kind of success if we're waiting on ourselves in these moments of pain body, in these reactive moments where we have no resources. If that's the time that we're waiting for ourselves to come through triumphantly on the horse, waving the flag and save ourselves to have a new thought, then we're not setting ourselves up for success. And even the awareness of that is something we have to be responsible for. We know that's not the time for us to create new or to create this healing. It's the work that we do beforehand, the work that we do every moment through every day that best supports us. So when those turbulent moments show up, that's when we can put our work into action and begin to see and create a new result. And what an empowering journey that becomes, because ultimately going full circle, even with this conversation, trauma is the byproduct of when we feel overwhelmed, when we didn't have resources, when we didn't have a supportive caregiver to help us through our emotions. The more consistently that happened, the more than the trauma lives in our body, lives in our nervous system, and then lives in our adult reactions. It is a very disempowered place. It's a highly reactive one. There is no space to make a new choice. However, when we begin the journey of self-awareness, of self-knowing, of creating safety and self-compassion along the way for ourselves, that actually then shifts that experience of overwhelm into little bits of stress that I can now tolerate, little things I can do to create safety, spaces that were once too much for me to handle, little by little become empowered choices that we can gift ourselves with. And the byproduct, the end result is truly amazing because it has impacts not only on ourselves but on the whole world around us. We're energetic beings. You often hear both of us say that. And what that means is the impact that we're making when we walk this journey, when we create safety where there wasn't, really does affect the world beyond even us. It affects our partners. Our partners can then feel safer. Our loved ones, our friends, our professional relationships will begin to feel differently because we're engaging with them differently. What an empowering journey. And one of the reasons why week after week, episode after episode, we have these conversations to not only acknowledge the humanness that continues to live within you and me, Jenna, here to obviously discuss what that looks like, where that comes from, and also the pathway out to begin the journey, the most empowering journey that I think all of us humans can go through, which is the journey of changing yourself, of transforming your entire way of being. There is no need. In fact, it is a massive disservice for anyone on this earth to be wearing the weight of the world and of other people on their own shoulders when the only person that you are first and foremost responsible for is yourself. And then of course, if you are a caregiver, then the young ones that you are looking after. However, it is not the rest of the world. It is not Nicole's responses and reactivity that is my work. My work is my work. It's how Jenna shows up in response to Nicole, to Furkan, who's here behind the scenes, to Lolly, to our team, to anyone 
In any situation, in any reaction that they're in, it's how I show up that is then going to color and create my world. That creates the weather around me. And whatever the weather is around me that I am creating is rippled out into the experience of Nicole, of Furkan, of Lolly, of anyone around me. So remember here to zero back in on you and yourself first. The journey is, always has been, always does, and will continue to start with you. And our journey, as always, will continue as we continue this conversation with you all listening, tuning in next episode. See you next week.